So please stand to your feet. The title of my message, The Sacred Struggle, Triumph Through Perseverance. Once again, as I traverse the sacred soil of the Holy Land this past two weeks, I really did seek the Lord's guidance and I, I believe he etched in my soul some inspiring truths that I wanna share with you in this message. I'll be reading from Genesis 32, beginning in verse 22, and here is the word of the Lord. And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants and his 11 sons and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them and sent them over the brook and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And so he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Let us pray, Lord. What an incredible story we, we find here in the life of our spiritual forefather, Jacob, who experienced an intimate life-changing encounter with you through a wrestling match. If we're honest, Lord, it's, this story is hard for many of us to fully grasp and comprehend. The idea of you, the Almighty, humbling yourself to wrestle with your chosen servant in the dust is beyond our understanding. But today, we ask that you would open up our hearts and minds to the deeper truths hidden within this story. Reveal to us what you want us to learn from this struggle and how it speaks to us concerning our faith in Christ. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. You may be seated. All right, so while we were there, the nation of Israel celebrated Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is their new year. What December 31st, January 1st is to Americans, Rosh Hashanah, October 6th. According to the Hebrew calendar, which is more of a biblical calendar, which is a more important calendar than the Roman Greco calendar that we're currently uh, under, uh, October 6th begins this, this new year. It was, of course, October 6th, the day before October 7th, when they were commemorating the greatest terrorist attacks on their soil in the history of the nation of Israel, of modern Israel, where 1,500 people were killed and or kidnapped. And I was able to, <clears throat> on the 7th, we went to the actual place where the Nova Festival concert was. And if you saw it, there's video there, all the, the signs and the pictures <clears throat> of loved ones that were lost. Um, the, the, I was gonna say crosses, but the, the markers of where they were killed and stones in, of remembrance, very heart-wrenching moment. Uh, high security, you could hear bombs going off. We, we went to one of the communities that called the kibbutz that, where the, some of the Jewish people live in that area. Uh, one of the women, and it's on the Facebook, gave us a tour and she no longer lives there, but she, was, she survived a, a heroine, a, a ex, experience that she, <clears throat> she and her family overcame. And uh, the, the attacks came so sudden and, they, and they, they admit they were caught off guard. They had become lax. Weakness invites aggression. It was right after this special holy day, Rosh Hashanah, that's when the terrorists launched their attack and a wave of three, uh, ultimately 6,000, but eventually 2,000 initially came in, bulldozers, they broke down the walls, uh, the barrier, they, they, you know, they, they flew in, um, hang gliders, uh, a very well-planned attack. And I filmed the vehicle graveyard uh, with row after row after row of cars uh, uh, and, and a several story, three, at least three story high of cars that were burnt beyond recognition. And as I'm standing there and I'm filming it, um, I'm thinking of the scale and the magnitude of this attack. Uh, there are only 9.5 million people that live in Israel. And uh, 1,500 people were killed. On our 9-11, 3,000 were, were killed on, on their day, 15, 1,500. So because of that, there was a special prayer gathering, a call to prayer. Uh, we went with Eagle's Wings, uh, I think perhaps the best Israeli tour guide that's been doing it now for 30 years. They've taken over, get this, over 30,000 Christians to Israel, over 500 pastors over the last few decades. Bishop Robert Stern's a mighty man of God that I think is the most important evangelical, spirit-filled Christian leader in America today related to our continued support of Israel and, and God's promises to the, 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 the people of God, the chosen people. 
So uh, we had this prayer meeting and uh, the pastors were able to meet with some dignitaries. One in particular was the former deputy mayor of Jerusalem. Uh, the, the people of Israel, they're cut from a different cloth. There's just a different spirit about them. I mean, their DNA, DNA is different because it's traced all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they're a warrior people, a warrior nation. They've had to be. So we met with uh, Fleur Hassan Nechem, and I'm probably pronouncing her name wrong, but there's a picture of her. And uh, she was just a powerful lady, very well, well respected. Might become a prime minister down the road. Uh, a, a great uh, ambassador for Israel, her country that she loves, she serves in. And she was sharing some deep insights with us. She opened up for question and answer. But she said something. She said, a year later from our terrorist attacks, we were really the only tour group there. Okay, we, the pastors in the group that was there, we actually had the entire country to ourselves, the parts that were safe enough for us to tour. And she said this, she said, during our time of grief, in our time of trauma, we are a nation that's traumatized. And she didn't say that as a victim. She just say, stated that as a matter of fact. We are, have been traumatized by what has occurred. And there's still 100 of our loved ones that are hopefully alive, but they're still being held hostage. She said this, she said, you being here, your support is a balm to our soul. I thought, Lord, there, there are so many reasons why we're here, why I'm here representing you, representing our church, our city, our nation why it's important for us to be here because Israel is our friend. They're the only democracy in the Middle East. It's 18 to 20 different <clears throat> countries there in the Middle East. All of them are monarchies or theocracies. Only Israel is a democracy. And they protect the right to religious freedom. Matter of fact, in the city of Jerusalem, the old city of Jerusalem, there's a Muslim quarter, a Jewish quarter, and a Christian quarter. People actually still live in that city as well as do business in that city. Millions of Tourists, <clears throat> over a million tourists a year come to Israel. Not now, it's been stopped, you know, brought to a screeching halt because of the war. So uh, <clears throat> they defend the right of Muslims to worship and Jews to worship and Christians to worship. And Israel does their best to keep the peace, which they've been able to do. It's quite rare and quite unusual. So uh, <clears throat> us being there at this time meant the world. And uh, they were very, very appreciative. But as this woman spoke, I begin to realize something. I begin to realize the tenaciousness, the tenacity, the, the resilience, the strength with which the Jewish people hold to their ancestry, hold to their covenant with God. Um, as she spoke, and she spoke with such conviction, I could actually, it was like I could hear the voice of Queen Esther. I could hear the voice of Ruth. I could, I could hear the voice of Deborah. I could hear these fearless women of the past who reshaped history because of their faith. In this, embodied in this woman at this particular moment. And it was kind of a sense of awe being there. You see, family, the Jewish people are the most, are remarkable because throughout history, they've been the one group of people that have been the most hated, the most hunted, the most pursued, the most murdered, almost annihilated over and over again. And yet they exist once again as a sovereign nation, even after being dispersed for 2000 years. It's, the, the history is absolutely incredible. If you didn't believe that there was a God, just look at the nation of Israel. I mean, the miracle after miracle after miracle. The fact that they are a sovereign nation once again as of May 14th, 1948. It started all the way back when they were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. Then Moses delivers them. They go through the wilderness for 40 years and then Joshua takes them into the promised land, the holy land, the land of promise, Israel, which is no bigger than the state of New Jersey, which only half of, uh, of Israel is even habitable because it's so much desert. And so here are these chosen people of God and they claim the promised land and they defeat the enemies and they establish a mighty empire, a mighty dynasty, Saul, King David, and his son Solomon. And then the troubles begin and 10 tribes backslide or the, the kingdom is divided, 10 tribes go to the north, they backslide, the Assyrians take them captive and they're scattered all over the world, never to be seen again. The two tribes in the southern kingdom where the temple was and Jerusalem was, uh, Judah particularly, they survived another 200 plus years. And then 586 BC, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians come, destroy the city, burn down the temple and, and take a bunch of people, kidnap a bunch of people back to Babylon. The, the book of Daniel, and Ezekiel, Isaiah are written, Jeremiah during that period of time. They're in bondage for 70 years in captivity. Then they come back, Ezra rebuilds the temple. This is their history. And I'm walking amongst all of this. I see the stones and the evidence of it. Ezra comes and rebuilds the temple. Nehemiah comes and rebuilds the walls. 
the city is, is still under domination. They don't have the, the strength and power they once had. And then the time of Jesus, the Romans are in control of the world. They're in control of the Holy Land. They're in control of Jerusalem. And Jesus, in one of his sermons concerning the end times, he looks at his disciples and says, you see the temple there, this, the beautiful temple, the center of worship for the Jewish people? He said, he said, it's gonna be torn down and not one stone will remain upon it until they're all torn down. They said, when's this gonna happen? Well, it happened as Jesus predicted within that generation, 70 AD. The Romans come in and destroy Jerusalem, kill the Jews, burn, destroy and burn the temple. We saw the evidence of it, the proof of it. So now the Jewish people are scattered. They're scattered all over the world for 2000 years. Why are they the most hated people? It's not because of their color of their skin because Jews are African of, of African descent, Jews are of Asian descent, Jews are of, uh, of Hispanic descent, Jews are of European descent. Jews are not just one color. Matter of fact, it's kind of funny, like when I go to Bogota, people walk up to me and they start speaking Spanish to me. Then I'm in Israel, people walk up, just, you know, a little dark complected, dark hair. They speak Hebrew to me. Until I say, uh, English, please, you know. I'm a little embarrassed, but, but, it's amazing how many people living in Israel that are Jews, they kind of look like me, you know? Uh, so it's not because of the color of their skin. Why are they so hated? It's because they are God's chosen. There's only one God. And God has only one group of people that he said, you are my chosen people, a people of promise, a people that God made a covenant with, and it's with the Jewish people. And the reason they are so hated and have been so hated throughout every generation and every, for century after century after century is it's because through the Jews came the prophets and through the Jews came the kings and through the Jews came the savior of the world, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And you feel that tension. But in the, in, the, in the Middle East, they're an oasis. They're the only democracy <laughs> in, in the sea of, of, of enemies all around them. And of course, they've made peace with Jordan and Egypt and Saudi Arabia. And um, it's interesting, we were, <laughs> we were in the old city of Jerusalem. We were in the Muslim quarter. Uh, we went into one of the shops and uh, one of the Muslim owners of the shop had some beautiful, beautiful um, artistic work that he created. They, their murals made out of limestone. Like the entire, all of Israel is basically built on a rock, okay? And uh, so their buildings are massive and beautiful and they're made from this Jerusalem stone and it's just absolutely beautiful. So he cuts the stone into little pieces, like little small little pieces, like a jigsaw puzzle. And I'm not doing it justice how I'm describing it, but it's absolutely beautiful. He has one of a lion and you know, one of, uh, of the countryside. And these, they're beautiful. And they're, 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 they come in this size and then they come in full-blown murals, murals. So we're in the Muslim quarter. This is a Muslim, right? He just wants to live life and run his business and worship the way he believes he's called to worship. And uh, he says, once again, where are you guys from? We say, Texas. He said, oh, Texas, you know, he's good. He had good English. And he said, I, I wanna show you something. He pulls out this mural, it was, roll, it was, it was rolled up, pulls out this mural, mural. He said, you're gonna like this. And there's a uh, mural that he created of President Bush on the assassination attempt with blood on his ear, with his hands in the air saying, fight, fight, fight. I'm like, are you kidding me? I said, how much is that? He said, $9,000. I said, thank you very much. <laughs> I don't like it that much. But here's a guy living in, in the city of Jerusalem knowing the importance of freedom. And he said, we hope he gets reelected. So they understand what it means to exist in a dangerous part of the world. And what has made Israel so unique is in spite of this hatred, in spite of throughout human history, the flames of hatred have licked at their heels across continents and for centuries. Yet like the Phoenix, they rise from the ashes and they've endured. Dispersed for 70 years, May 14th, 1948, they come back to a desert wasteland. A nation, as the Bible says, is born in a day. And with my own eyes, I know this is my third trip, but you just learn something in, in, in deeper truths, enter into your heart every time you go. I'm standing in Tel Aviv. It's like the, uh, it's like the center of modern technology. It's, it's, it's only second to um, California, Silicon Valley, with the innovation and technology that they're creating in Tel Aviv. They're 76 years old. 
thriving cities. They are a major power in the world. They have nuclear power. They have nuclear warheads, which they don't admit, but they have them. In just 76 years, the tallest skyscraper in the Middle East, really the only skyscraper, is in Tel Aviv, 22 stories high. You know what Hamas and Hezbollah, these terrorist groups, you know Hamas is the one in control of Palestine. They're the ones that were voted in by the Palestinians. They're the ones that have declared war against Israel. And it's a war that that Israel needs to win and they need to continue to fight until they win it 100%. You know what they build? You know what the bill with the funding that they've, they've received $90 million from Iran. You know what they built? They don't build skyscrapers. They build not up, but down. They dig holes and they dig tunnels. The elaborate tunnel system that they've built, some go down 20, 260 feet, 26 stories down. Israel is building things up to make the world a better place. They're building in the ground, burrowing in the ground to find ways to hurt, kill, maim innocent men, women, and children. And I thought, that's Israel, it's a democracy. It's a, it's a jewel of democracy, not just in that part of the world, but in all of the world. How have they beaten the odds? How do they even exist after six million, no, excuse me, 17, evidence now, 17 million Jews killed during World War II? And where are the Nazis today? Nowhere to be found. Where are the Babylonians today? Nowhere to be found. Where is the Roman Empire today? Nowhere to be found. But where are the Jews? They're in the land that God promised them and their ancestors. And in a day, a nation was born. But they've been able to face the hardships and the struggles. And that's what the story of Jacob is all about. Their ancestor, Jacob, taught them a lesson, a powerful lesson that I think America once knew, but maybe we've become too soft. Jacob needed to find his manhood. You know, the Bible describes Jacob and his brother Esau. They were twins. Esau was born first. Jacob was holding on to his brother's heel. That's why his name Jacob, the one who holds onto the heel, the trickster. That's why he was given that name. Esau was born first. Even at birth, he was struggling. But the Bible tells us that Jacob was kind of a mama's boy. He loved being in the tent. He loved being with his mom. He had a better relationship with his mom than his dad. Nothing wrong with that. But the boy has got to become a man at some point. So God had to teach him how to find his manhood. He ran from his brother. His brother was a hunter. His father favored his brother Esau because of his, I guess you'd say, one version. There's different versions of masculinity, but his masculinity of being a warrior and being a hunter. But Jacob, if he was going to be the leader of Israel, of an entire new nation, he was gonna have to find the fight, the soldier, the warrior in him. So it's no coincidence that God gets into a wrestling match with him. How many of you dads know to make sure that your, your boys grow up right, they need to have some times where they're just rolling in the carpet with dad. Oh, no, they can't do that. Little Johnny might get hurt. Oh, he might get afraid and become fear. No, little Johnny needs to grow up and become a man someday. And that's not the only way, but that's one of the ways that Johnny learns how to be a man. He knows how to defend himself. Can I get a witness in the house of God? Do I still live in the land of the free, in the home of the brave, in the land of the free? So imagine God in a wrestling match with Jacob. And of course, God wasn't really losing this match. Just like a father lets his son think he's winning to teach him a valuable lesson. In the end, he could pulverize him at any moment, but he lets him think he's winning, right? God lets Jacob think he's winning because he wants to bring something out of Jacob. He now needs to go from being Jacob, the trickster, Jacob, the one who lives under the heel of everybody else, to Jacob, who is Israel, a prince with God who's gonna be a leader of a nation. And from his loins is gonna come a great nation, a nation that's gonna to have to learn how to struggle if they're going to survive. And so he's wrestling. And it goes all night. Some of you that actually have a wrestling background, maybe in high school or college, you have what, three rounds, two, three minute rounds? I don't know. That's just, that looks like a painful sport to me. But anyway, all night. Now, the day's about to, the dawn's about to break, a whole night, and, and, the, and, and this is a theophany. All biblical scholars pretty much agree on this. This wasn't just an angel, it was God. It was the second member of the Godhead. A, a theophany is a pre-Bethlehemic manifestation of the second member of the Godhead. In many occasions in the Old Testament, Jesus appeared as the angel of the Lord, or as the, Paul said, the rock that followed them in the, in the wilderness, that rock was Christ, Paul said, writing to the Corinthians. So these are manifestations of Messiah in the Old Testament. So he's wrestling all night, and the Lord says, the, the, the day's about to break. 
And there's a great deep spiritual truth to all of this church. Sometimes weeping may endure for the night, but joy does come in the morning. You just need to struggle, you need to hold on, you need to fight through until the sun will rise again upon your struggles in life and a blessing will come your way. And the dawn represents insight and revelation that you wouldn't have had prior to it. Which means what? Not only for Israel, but for all of us, even us as a nation, we've had our struggles. We're, we get stronger through our struggles or we get weaker. But if our faith is in God through our struggles, we, struggles, we can come out stronger. And so it, it teaches us. It teaches us that some blessings, some lessons only come through our struggles. And Israel's history teaches us that true victory is found not in avoiding hardship, but in facing it head on with courage and faith. So they really are, number one, the eternal comeback kings, Israel. Knocked down, but they don't stay down. They've battled the odds since day one. They've battled the odds since David defeated Goliath. And something tr transformational occurs. God says, your name will no longer be Jacob, but, but Israel. You've struggled with God and with humans and you've prevailed. He, he's about to have to struggle with Esau. He's fearful that when he meets his brother Esau, because he promised to kill Jacob, that he was gonna be killed by Esau and he had to find his courage for the journey that was ahead. That's the significance of this. And for all of us, we have our struggles, things that we're wrestling with. Struggling maybe in your marriage or as a parent or struggling in your business or, or struggling in an addiction. We all have our battles, we all have our struggles, but God hasn't forsaken us. And we have to keep fighting, we have to keep persevering, knowing that through, the, that through Christ we have the victory. It may not seem like you have the victory right now, but don't wave the white flag. Don't throw in the towel. There's something about being in the bomb shelter our very first night, 10 minutes from where we were at, the, the, the terrorists were shooting and they, they killed like eight or nine innocent people. We were eating in the, in the uh, cafeteria area of the hotel. When the sirens go off, this is kind of like normal for the Israelis. Thank, thankfully, I eat fast, so I finished my dinner. <laughs> Sorry for the rest of you. But the sirens go off and we have to now go down into the bomb shelter. And you saw the video, you know, we're down in the bomb shelter for an hour, almost two hours, I guess, and then 300, 200 plus missiles are being you know, sent over by the... Uh, Iranian in the military in the Iron Dome, thank God for mili mili American uh, military technology, shoots down every one of them. We're able to come back out. And the very next day, it seems like in Israel, the Israelites is like a no another normal day. When's the last time you had to go into a bomb shelter living in our cities here in America, right? But that's the world they live in because their enemy, the enemy wants to push them from the river, Jordan River to the sea, the Mediterranean Sea. They want, they want all their land, not just a portion. Not want all, they want them completely annihilated. And it seems as though they come out after having to be in a bomb shelter and it just seems like it's normal, which you don't ever want to make it make, become normal. But they almost have this attitude. Is that the best you got? Is that all you've got? That's kind of the attitude that you and I because we have this spiritual ancestry through Christ to the Jewish people. That when the enemy throws everything at you, including the kitchen sink, you have to truly believe greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. When it seems like you're down on the mat and about to be out for the final time, you can have a second chance. You can have a second <laughs> life. You can begin again. So James said, consider it pure joy, brothers, when you're facing trials of many kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Romans 5, 3 and 4, we glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering or through our struggles, it produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character, what? Hope. You can't do without hope. And it's moments like this that, that we are transformed. Transformation through struggle. We go from the burden to the blessing. Sometimes we want the the, the, the crown without the cross. We want the, the blessing without the burden. We want the victory without the battle, but it doesn't happen that way. The story of Jacob is not just about survival, but transformation. And that can be your story, friend. Through your hardships, through your struggles, there's meaning that can come from it. There's power that can be extracted from it. You could become a better person because of it. Not in spite of it, but because of it. You think of Joseph and the story of Joseph, his brothers betray him, they wanna kill him, and he's, then he's misunderstood and lied about, thrown in prison, and, but he had a dream. And when he finally becomes the prince of 
Egypt, the second in command, only under Pharaoh, most powerful man in the world at that time. His brothers, he reveals himself to his brothers and his brothers are fearful that, that he's gonna take vengeance on them. He's gonna take revenge. And he said, it's so profound. He said, okay, this is what the, the, the Jewish nation has done. They don't allow their suffering to define them. They define their suffering. You and I need to learn how not to allow the events that have happened in your life to define you, but for you to define those events that have happened in your life. And this is what Joseph did. He said to his brothers, he didn't say it with malice or hatred. He said, you meant this for evil because there are people in this world who do evil things to other people. And he didn't pull any punches. He said, you meant this for evil, but God. <laughs> oh, friends, no matter what happens to you, no matter what's come your way, no matter what struggles you will face or you have faced, but God. Oh, it's the story doesn't end with the attacks that you've experienced. The story doesn't end with the addiction that you have battled with because when all that happens in, in your life, but God, two words, but God. He said, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good. Hallelujah. For Joseph's good, for his brother's good, even those that did evil against him. He didn't pay them back with evil, he paid them back with good. And that's why the Bible says, don't be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Because at the end of the day, it's not the evil people that will win, but the good people that will win who are on God's side, hallelujah. And finally, they have this resilience in the Holy Land. I saw it up front and up close and personal. They have this resilience over victimhood. Of any group of people that could feel like victims and they could be whining and complaining and crying about how they've been victimized and misunderstood. This, but they're too busy building an empire. They're, they're too busy building a life. They're too busy doing good. That's the power of struggle, the power of perseverance. The Jewish people, both in ancient and modern times, exemplify this resilience in the face of adversity. So the story of Jacob wrestling with God is not one of defeat, but one of triumph, of a hard fought struggle. And out of that struggle can come blessing. Matter of fact, in the story, verse 26, uh, the Lord says, hey, the, the, the day is dawning, let me go. God could have broke free at any moment, but he wants to bring the best out of us. He said, let me go. And what did Jacob say? Oh, you gotta love Jacob, right? Now Israel found his manhood. He said, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. I will hold on to you till the end of the ages. I want a blessing. And he got it. You know, sometimes God's blessings come to those who are really desperate for them and really want them. Like Rachel said one time, give me children lest I die. God said, okay. Sometimes there's this level of desperation of our faith that we're gonna hold on to the promises of God until the promises of God become reality in my life. I don't care if it takes 10 years. I don't care if it takes 20 years. I don't care if I'm on my dying deathbed and I don't even care after I die. I still believe those promises that God made shall be fulfilled. So even on our dying deathbed, we are gonna hold on saying, God, we're not gonna let go until the blessing is bestowed. Come on, somebody, give God praise in the house of God. Israel has had no time to lick their wounds. Victimhood has always been rejected because they know this, their scars have become their armor. They're a different breed. They're a different people. And I have, wit I have witnessed it now three times, but this time it struck me more than ever before because of what they have just gone through, the worst attack in their history as a nation and they're taking it to the enemy. They're, they're, they're not backing down because they don't have the luxury to take their freedom and their lives for granted. This has changed the political climate. Israel was going left, leaning left, but this was a wake-up call. We got our wake-up call in January or September 11th, 2001, on 9-11. But it seems as though we have lost our way, first and foremost, spiritually as a nation. We've lost what it means to be an American, 
the exceptionalism of being an American, because of the Judeo-Christian faith, because of our founding fathers, because of our documents. And as I was warned by this tour guide, this brilliant tour guide, me and along with the, all the other pastors that were there with me, that we're losing our country, that we've lost our way because we've lost sight of why we exist to begin with. But it's not too late. There is a people, the people of God that are rising up, that are awaking from their slumber and are claiming their inheritance in Christ and are advancing the kingdom of God in these last days. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we humbly come before you today. We thank you for this <clears throat> powerful life lesson of struggle, that blessing comes through struggle. Sometimes we get weary in the fight, but thank you for our spiritual second wind. Thank you for when we run out of our strength, we run into your strength, God. I pray that for men and women today, young men, young women who have, are, are facing their own struggles in life. May they come to this promise and realization there's a blessing on the other side. Don't give up. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're here today and you've not been born again, you don't have the assurance of heaven as your eternal home, then I want you to pray this prayer with me. If you're a bachelor and Christian, let this be for you a prayer of rededication. The important thing is that you mean it from your heart, you say it with your mouth. You're turning your life over to God, you're repenting of your sins, and you're receiving in this prayer, all of this is gonna happen. You're turning to God in faith, repenting of your sins to God. He's gonna forgive you, and Christ the Lord is gonna come into your life. You're gonna be born again. Become a brand new person on the inside from your heart, with your mouth. Here we go. Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a savior. There's only one savior. His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, come into my heart, come into my life, be my Lord and be my savior. I turn from sin to the true and living God. I receive his love, his grace, and his forgiveness. Dear God in heaven, you're now my father and I am your child. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit and give me strength to live for you and serve you all the days of my life, beginning today for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give God praise together in the house of God?